next panel is extremely exciting. I think pretty much anyone here, no matter what you do, you're intrigued by space. That place that pretty much none of us, apart from some of these people, have ever been to or are likely to get to unless we become billionaires at this rate. Um, so we're now talking about the future of space ex exploration and aviation with a very interesting panel. Some of us who were at the speaker's dinner last night had a little taster of how interesting this is going to be. So joining us on stage now, we have Sabine Clark, the CTO at Airbus, Ellen Ubi, the co-founder and CEO of the Exploration Company, Samantha Chris Foretti, the first woman astronaut to be in charge of the ISS, and Cedric O, the former Secretary of State for Digital and a member of Sisters Board of Directors. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to be here with you today. So I'm Cédric O. I used to be a minister of digital in France, and I'm now a, a proud member of uh, the board of Tista. So, <laughs> um, so at Tista, we obviously like to talk about closing the, the gap between uh, men and women, but we moreover like the women that shape the technological world. And there's not such thing as a technological domain than the, the space domain. And that's actually what we are here to talk uh, with you about. Um, I'm very happy and honored to have today three very distinguished guests uh, that I'm going to present in a few words. I'm going to begin with you, Samantha. So Samantha Cristoferetti. You used to be a, a fighter pilot into the Italian Air Force. You entered the astronauts program for the European Space Agency in 2009. You did two trips to space. The first one was in uh, 2014 or 2015, uh, where you stayed for 200 days in the International Space Station. And you liked that so much that you came back in 2022, uh, when you became the first European woman to become the commander in chief of the International Space Station on September 2022. So thank you very much for being with us today. <laughs> then Sabine Cloker. Sabine, thank you for being here today. Uh, Sabine has been working for, with Airbus for uh, almost 20 years now. Uh, you held different positions within manufacturing, engineering, production, product development, programs, development processes, and so on. You've been head of engineering within Airbus Research and Space, and you're now Airbus Chief Technology Officer since 2021. Thank you very much. <laughs> and last but not least, Hélène. Hélène Ubi, so you're the co-founder of the exploration company one of the most high-profile startup, space startup. You just raised 40 million uh, on the venture fund, and you aim at creating, I would say, a space giant, beginning with be creating a space shuttle between France and Germany. Uh, and you previously worked with Airbus uh, as head of space strategy and Orion program, and with Orion also on its rocket program. Thank you very much for being here today. So let's jump um, quickly into the subject. So there are two things that I want to discuss with you, the three of you today. The first one is about the current revolution that we are experiencing, because there are so many things that are changing into the aerospace, the space, and aviation domain that could shape our future, Europe's future. And the second thing is, I think that it's very particular to be in position of management in those periods and that there are a lot of takeaways that we can take from uh, the three of you. So maybe we, we can begin with that, the revolution, the space revolution, and what's currently unfolding. Maybe, Ellen, I can begin with you, because being with the exploration company, one of the main European actors into the new space industry, you have a very good overview of the, the challenge that we are facing. Thank you, uh, Cedric, for your question. So what has changed? One point is first speed. Uh, 15 years ago, it was the first launch of Falcon 1. And uh, now SpaceX with Falcon 9 has completely revolutionized the way we produce launchers. Um, to make it very simple, price of sending something to space 
in round about 10 years, move from 20,000 euro per kilogram. Today it's round about 5,000 euro per kilogram. And tomorrow, potentially, with the next launcher of SpaceX, will be round about 500 euro per kilogram. Before, if you send something to space, it costs a lot to send. Then you want that whatever has been sent there is super reliable and can stay for very long. So we are producing huge satellites that could stay for 15 years with high-tech technology, but not up-to-date. And what has happened is that if you don't have to pay too much stuff to send things up to space, then you can afford to say things which are much more affordable, made of technology developed for the computer industry, for the automotive industry. And this basically gave birth to the constellation. First, with the Earth observation, we move from a world where observation data from space were used mostly by military people to today a world where data from space imagery is used not only to understand the climate, but also by agriculture, logistic people to optimize our activities on Earth. The second big trend is communication. We are moving from a world, and five years ago, Starlink didn't exist, or one web. Today, Starlink, you've all heard about it because of Ukraine, has more than 2.5 million clients. And I believe that in 10, 15 years, probably more than 50% of our communication will use space. So that's the second big revolution. We need communication everywhere at any time, broadband for autonomous vehicles, and space going to be the answer. And that's why in Europe we develop RE Square, because we cannot accept that all this infrastructure of communication will be only owned by private non-European players. And the third revolution is about Samantha. It's about what I'm building. It's about exploration, and space being not a place where we go, but a place where we stay. And to give you just an order of some figures, ideas, today up there you have two space stations, one Chinese and one international. By the end of the decade, most probably you'll have four space stations. In 15 years, probably five, six. Around the moon, you have zero today, in five years, you'll have two space stations around the moon. So space starts to become a destination that we as humans, step by step, expand, live there. And like, you know, in the 15th century, we didn't discover the new world in one year, not in five years, not in 20 years. It took one century with many people failing and trying and discovering but at the end, we mastered how to go there and how to live there. The same is happening in space. It will not take one year, two years, three years. It will take perhaps one century, like for the aviation. It took 70 years between like, the first commercial flight to the creation of Ryanair. But we are at this point in time in history where space exploration, living in space, is becoming more and more accessible, and where we build infrastructure for people, not only astronauts. By the end of the decade, there'll be more private astronauts than professional astronauts being sent to space. So we are at this very exciting time where space becomes accessible for humanity as a destination. Thank you very much, uh, Hélène. <laughs> Samantha, to, to some extent, you've been living that revolution from inside. Um, you became an astronaut in 2009, so it's only a decade ago, but it seems centuries ago in terms of space. Just to remind you, like 10 years ago, Ariane Espace, so uh, the, the Europeans were launching more than half of the rockets, commercial rockets that would go to, uh, um, to, to the space. This year, SpaceX is planning to launch 100 rockets. Maybe they won't succeed to reach out to 100, and the European, but it's going to be close to 100, and the European will only launch four. So based on what Helen just said, there are also a lot of issues and challenges for Europe in that, in that regard. 
So I have two questions for you, um, Samantha. The first one is, how did you leave that acceleration as an astronaut? So what has changed over the past decade? And since I know you have strong advocacy for European sovereignty on that point, how do you think Europe should position itself in those issues? Yeah, absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to address this topic. Yes, indeed. I, um, well, first of all, I'd like to say to the point of uh, half of the communication going through space, I think that this mic is going to space and back. because <laughs> we are <laughs> So we're giving a good example of the use of uh, space assets here. <laughs> Um, but uh, yes, indeed, I, I became an astronaut in 2009. Uh, as I say sometimes in France, my real claim to fame is that I know Thomas Pesquet personally. I touch him once in a while to see that he's real. He's real. Um, and uh, both of us, Thomas and I, did our first flight, um, you know, seven, eight years ago. And we flew on a uh, Soyuz vehicle. And then we did a second flight, myself last year, Thomas, a couple of years ago, on a completely different vehicle, a SpaceX Crew Dragon vehicle. So just to give you an idea of what that means, it's that we flew on a vehicle that if you had a lot of money set aside and you were so inclined, you could go and buy a seat on. In fact, you can buy the entire vehicle. You could buy yourself a spacecraft and bring your friends along for a weekend in space if you wanted. This has happened already. So to me, this is a complete revolution on so many levels. I mean, I grew up in the 80s. I was a child in the 80s and then a teenager in the 90s. And space exploration was this thing that mostly Americans and the Soviet Union did, you know, eventually turned into Russia. It was this, this thing out there, really hard, just for superpowers. And then when I became an astronaut in 2009, it had not changed that much. Of course, as Europeans, we were more part of it. In particular, we were partners in the International Space Station program. So we had a piece of Europe up there, a tiny piece of space station, about eight and a half percent of the International Space Station belongs to us, it's our home. Um, but it was still very normal for me that if you want to actually fly to space, you have to go to the United States or to Russia. And it felt, flying along on a Russian vehicle in this international crew, you really felt like you were part of this international community. Yes, it wasn't our vehicle, it was a Russian vehicle, but you had pretty free access. We, you know, we, we all felt part of a community. It was all very open. I could take pictures, I could share the story. Now, fast forward seven years, and this whole situation has completely changed. Now, all of a sudden, I'm flying on a private vehicle. It's not a government vehicle anymore. It's not Russian, it's America. But all of a sudden, I'm training at a private company where, you know, to get to the training facility in the company, I have to be escorted. They come and pick me up at the entrance. They escort me to the training facility. I'm not allowed to take any pictures. I'm not even allowed to go out in the corridor and escort to heat my lunch at the microwave. And all of a sudden, you're not, I mean, you can ask all the questions, but you're not necessarily getting all the answers because it, it's commercial, it's proprietor, it's intellectual property, it's uh, competitive. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, wait a second, I, I don't feel that much like I'm part of the community. And so it's driving this point home of like, well, I'm kind of like a guest on somebody else's space program, which is great to have an opportunity to be part of it and fly to space station, but it's a completely different feeling. And then you start wondering, well, wait a second. I mean, if a private company can do that, and by the way, if in the meantime, the Chinese have demonstrated all the capabilities that Americans and Russians master in low Earth orbit, they have demonstrated as well. The next ones will be the Indians. They're going to launch their space vehicle next year. And then as a European astronaut, you kind of wonder, well, where is Europe? Where are we? Why don't we have our own vehicle, right? Um, and I believe it's necessary on, on a number of levels. I think it's necessary to the way we are perceived in the world. Like it or not, I think the ability of mastering space exploration and human space flight is part of your standing internationally within an international context. 
you know, people wonder. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, it's still perceived as this uh, ambitious, hard problem to solve, right? And so you think, well, the Chinese solved it, the Indians will, the Russians, of course, the uh, Americans, of course, and who's going to be next? Maybe the Middle East, maybe the Brazilians, who knows? And it's like, oh, Europe doesn't even participate in this game. It's too hard for them. They can't get along among each other. They worry about other things. It just gives the wrong message to the rest of the world. And it gives the wrong message to our own people, to our own self-perception as Europeans, to our own talented, young, ambitious people who sometimes prefer to go elsewhere because there's like, well, elsewhere they know how to tackle the hard problems, not here. But it's also an economic opportunity and it's not by chance that we have an entrepreneur here on stage. She's about making money, right? So <laughs> there's money to be made in space. Of course, it needs public funding. We need the political will, the political drive to jumpstart this, just like the Americans did. But eventually, there is going to be an economy in low Earth orbit. I don't know if there's going to be an economy in on orbit manufacturing. Some people bet that there will be, maybe. I don't know if there's going to be an economy in space tourism. Some people bet there will be, maybe. Certainly there's going to be a thriving economy in orbit servicing. In the end, it's all the same business. It's all the same technologies. It's all the same capabilities. It's all the same industrial base that allows you to do all things. So in my opinion, it's important to answer your question to invest in space exploration because it gives you that technological edge, that industrial competitiveness that you can then leverage across the board where for sure 100% there will be a thriving market, while at the same time giving you all those other benefits in terms of geopolitical standing, international image, self-perception, European pride, inspiration to our youngsters to go and pursue STEM careers. And all of that in the end is so vital for our prosperity and honestly for our security. I think if there's something that the Ukraine world has driven home as a point, even to the general public, it was pretty clear in the military world for a long time, but I, I think it's, it, it's pretty uh, come through also in, in the media reporting in, to the broad public that if Ukraine has been able to withstand an aggression from such a powerful neighbor, it's mainly because the capabilities of space assets were made available to them. So again, it's, a, it's an investment in our future, it's an investment in our prosperity, it's an investment in our security. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Thank you very much for that uh, very powerful advocacy. There there are a few questions I want to get back to that. Maybe we can get back to that later. I first want to turn to you, Sabine. Um, actually, Ellen mentioned the fact that there are some parallels between the day that the space industry is experiencing compared to what aviation experienced a few decades ago, <laughs> almost 100 years ago. But to be honest, I've Aviation is also experiencing its own revolution because obviously of climate change, because of uh, the pressures that is on uh, um, plane manufacturers, aircraft engine manufacturers to be more sensitive to climate change and maybe to build something that is uh, uh, aiming at uh, being able to reach out, reach out the carbon zero, um, carbon natural goal. How do you leave that? How, as a CTO, how do you see that revolution? And how do you manage that? Yeah, thank you. First of all, I mean, the great thing about space is that it always will stay an inspiration and so inspirational. And my six-year-old daughter, for her, it's clear she will be an astronaut. <laughs> Maybe this will change, but let's see how, it's, how it looks like by the time when she's ready to go. So if you look at aviation, then yes, we are living a, a real revolution and basically we are in the fourth revelation of, uh, of aviation. The first one, yes, you mentioned it, more around 130 years ago now, it was flying as such. Famous physicists at the time, Mr. Lord Kelvin, said just a machine flying, which is more heavy than, than air, this will never happen. 
eight years later, we were flying. The Watts brothers were flying the first aircraft. So that was the first revolution, can we fly? And the second one was about safety. In the 60s, we really worked on the safety on, on aviation. We improved about 250 times. So aviation is the safest way to travel today, even if there is still a way to go. And, and it will always be at the heart of, of what we are doing as engineers in, in aviation. And the third revolution, you mentioned it, it was about democratizing flying. Today, if you look, just an example, in France, I would say 40% have taken a flight in the last year. So everybody can fly today. You talked about Ryanair. That's a huge achievement. On the other hand, aviation is responsible for 2.5 percent of the overall CO2 emissions in the world. That can seem small. On the other hand, we have to do something about it. So this is bringing us really to the revolution we are just living through. And this is what we call the fourth revolution. Because if we don't tackle it, we really see it as losing the license to operate, maybe. So we are really in that point. We need to make aviation sustainable, manage to fly without emitting CO2 emissions. And that's, you can say, it's the best time to be <laughs> in aviation or be an engineer in aviation. It's a, it's a huge revelation. So the whole question is about how do we um, come up with a power source which can replace kerosene, which is basically physically the best way to propulse uh, an aircraft. And for this, we are actively looking in all types of technology at the moment. The first one is about engines. So what is the next type of engine, including what is the next type of kerosene? Can it be hydrogen? Can it be biofuels? Probably we need a mix of, of everything. And then, of course, it's also about all the components in an aircraft. What can be the best wings to be able to fly? So we are really looking how birds fly and, and how we can, can learn from nature in order to really bring it even better. And though you could go along the whole aircraft <laughs> and look at every and each and every component, but this is really at the heart today to be able to make that step. So in 2035, we want to be ready and have an, a real zero emission aircraft in the market. So a rather big aircraft, 100 to 200 uh, packs as we know them today, and be able to fly. So this is really a pathway from today towards there, where it's going through all the different steps of making this material safe and as well economically viable, of course. And if I can jump in at that moment of the conversation, I think in the audience we have entrepreneurs, decision makers, investors, um, how do you manage that from a management point of view? Because you have big companies that has always been doing airplanes using uh, fuel and that has first to reinvent, reinvent its story because it's under pressure of the public society and it still has to hire. So what, what is the storytelling that you say to people that you want to hire? And how do you have your team taking risk within the big company because if you don't take risks, then you're going to do the same business that you've always been doing. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, <clears throat> yes, on one hand, it is a topic which is important for everybody. And let me give two points of view to the, to the way to manage, how to make it reality. First of all, we cannot do that revolution alone. We need the whole ecosystem, the community, being it researchers, small companies, big companies. We are looking across industries as well. We have partnerships with Renault on batteries, on the same time with Elring Klinger, an automotive supplier in Germany, 
on fuel cells. So we are really looking uh, around the home. And secondly, if we look at the leadership question, yes, uh, my teams are about 13,000 engineers. So not everybody of them will immediately be on, on the topic of what is the next engine. Impossible. On the other hand, it is really starting with what is the vision, what is the purpose, because everybody is fond of doing this revelation. So today, during the COVID time, actually, we came up with the purpose for the company, which is pioneering sustainable aviation for a safe and united world. And this is encompassing a lot of things. It's aerospace, it's space, it's defense, and it's around this core of how we unite the world and, and stay connected, because this is really something which we, which we will see that is core and it will stay. So it's about for the big community to be able to be part of it and to, to, to feel part of as well this working for this purpose. And that you can see it every day that, that yes, m my engineers, they really want to be part of it. And, and that's the one part of it. The other one, and you mentioned it, is how as a big company, I mean, when we started, we were just always running after Boeing. That was so easy. <laughs> now we are this big ship, we are a big company, and we have to disrupt ourselves, disrupt Thing, uh, the, yourself is always very difficult. So we've created as well spaces which are outside of the big company. So for instance, we have our own startups where we mix people who would leave everything they know from the big company, the contracts even, go for a project uh, into, into a subsidiary or into a separate company where we mix people with usually the competences that we don't have so much, like digital or hydrogen or others, and to really build a project team, fail fast, learn fast, run fast on demonstrating things. So usually these are things that are flying, but subsystems. And that's creating a completely different way of leading as well of managing projects. So we are completely agile, self-empowered, and, and you can feel this energy, this is coming up. So it's, at least in, in our view, it is really creating as well this startup um, way of working. Maybe the risk taking is not exactly that, <laughs> <laughs> but at least it's something that we are very consciously doing in order to grow as well the number of people who have learned how to work like this and then come eventually back into the company and bring the things forward. So Thank these are just two examples of what are the ingredients of, of leadership in, in this term. Thank you very much. I think that, that idea of circumventing some safe space, I would say, it, in order to foster creativity, something very interesting into a big company. Uh, Hélène, maybe on that same question of risk, because you're on the other edge, I would say, because you're a startup on something that is with high risk, high potential. But how do you manage that question of risk? How do you have your engineers take the right level of risk, enough to be disruptive enough, but not too much to put the life of the company in danger? And you have 3.5 minutes. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, so, perhaps just, just to be clear, so we built a space capsule, and we hope we can bring Samantha to uh, space one day. Um, the question when we started the company was not, what's the risk? It was, why are we doing that? And for us, it was the right thing to do. Because as Samantha mentioned, we have no way in Europe, no capacity to participate to the building of this new space world. So it was about why I'm here, how can I use my talents, and what's the right thing to do with the talents I have? And what's the, what's the final product? What's the final goal I want to reach? And we said, hey, we want to give to Europe its own capsule. We want to do it with European values. So we want to do it sustainable. We are the first in the world to use green propellant. 
the first in the world. We are the first in the world to be privately funded. And we are the first in the world to open source our interfaces, because Europe is about cooperation. So that was the why. And then comes the how. And here you might at risk. If I want to go there, I'm not going to start building a super, super, super fancy, sexy capsule. So we first did a baby capsule that's going to fly this year. Then we are now manufacturing the teenage capsule that's going to fly next year. And then we'll go find a final product. So we do it step by step, and we raise money step by step, like 5 million or 40 million, and then another 100 million. So I attract people, and we've received more than 25,000 applications in less than two years. I attract people because what I propose is a mission. And I select people based on mission purpose. We don't want people attracted by money. We don't want people attracted by power. And people come because they want to pioneer. They want to develop new technology. We're working on a thermal protection that will be lighter, more solid, and reusable. It's never been done in Europe. We're working on an engine that can be refueled in orbit. Only SpaceX is working on that today. So engineers, they know they can build something new, and they can give Europe, and I think that's one of the aim of Europe, this capacity to build bridges. If we're not there, it will be China against the US. And that will be our future in space. And I think space is about inspiration for peace. And if we're here with our capsule, and I hope other vehicles, Europe can bring something more peaceful and more cooperative. So that's our mission, much more than a product. And our product is at the edge of innovation. And we are building something new every day. And this is what motivates people. They know why they are there. And they give their best every day. And the fact that we can potentially die because we're a startup, and see if I fail the first mission, if we fail the second mission, of course, the company is not going to do great. It's an additional energy to solve problem, because we have no choice but find a solution. And for the time being, every big problem we had, because my team is made of a mix of highly experienced and very young people, they found solution, and we're moving forward, and we're still on track, keeping our promises vis-a-vis -vis our investors. So this is what brings risk. It's just it forces you to give the best of yourself, and then you're super happy. Well, building on top of that, I think that question of mission, that question of how do you build a top-performing team and how do you build a team that can work even in, within extreme conditions has some parallels to uh, what you've been experiencing uh, in, in the International Space Station for a few reasons. First, there is no plan B. I mean, you're here with the others for X days, and X days can be very long, so you have to have things work. Because second, if things do not work, then there is no plan B. So you cannot escape and see other things. And if things begin to work not well, then it can be very dangerous. How do you see that? How do you manage that, Samantha? Because actually you were an astronaut and you were a commander. So how do you deal with that from a leadership point of view? Yeah, um, I, I like to say it's, it, 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 it's pretty easy uh, leading a crew on the International Space Station, I, I would say. Um, because I, I think that in, in this particular type of environment, the team skills, so the ability to perform well within a team is actually really on the forefront of the criteria that we use to select new astronauts. And it's, it's the main criteria that astronauts are judged upon and evaluated upon when, when we come back. So in it's, the end... It's even, sorry, it's even in the selection process. Yes. So we, we select for people that have that kind of personality, but also that kind of experience. So it, it would be extremely unlikely to get selected as an astronaut, even if you're incredibly smart and technically competent and an athlete, 
if all you've done in your life is work on your own alone, uh, because you've, you've just not demonstrated that, that capability at all. So we typically hire people who have, you know, maybe military experience, or uh, they've done expeditions, they've been in Antarctica, they've been in some expeditions in extreme places. So something that shows that in an operational or operational similar analog environment, you are able to work with a team in a place where there's living together, where there is procedures that have to be followed, where there is rules, where there is consequences for mistakes, where you know, the, the people that we're, you're with are the people that you're with. You know, that you're not going to change them, and, and it might be for, for the long run. So we, we typically solve that problem almost in the selection by, by taking people that have already demonstrated that capability. But then it, it keeps getting stressed throughout your professional life because it's almost a job where, from a technical point of view, most people are almost overqualified uh, because there's a lot of people out there who want to be astronauts. And so it, it's fairly easy to find people that have the necessary technical skills. And the technical demands of the jobs are not that hard because there is so much training. So they teach you all the stuff that you need to know. And so then what really makes a difference and they're going to evaluate you on is like how good of a crew member you were, how good were you to your uh, crewmates? Did you um, promote the well-being and the success of the team and, and the mission over your own ambitions and uh, your own aspirations and your own needs? So, um, and, and I think it's because, at least in the, in, again, in the space environment, historically, it's been shown that uh, a high-performing team really makes or breaks the mission as opposed to high-performing individuals. Thank you very much. I think that's, that's very interesting to see the parallels on how you prefer both to be in an edgy startup or to be an astronaut, like team, uh, that people that are performing, performing well as a team than as a, as a, out of their sheer competence. Thank you very much. We are um, unfortunately running out of time, and that old panel is um, almost uh, coming to an end. We are going to take two questions from the audience uh, for guests. So please. Hello. Thank you, Helena. This question is for you. Um, how do you concretely see space as an inspiration for peace? I think when you think about the International Space Station or when you think about the docking of an American vehicle and a Russian vehicle in the past, I still hope tomorrow of an American vehicle and a Chinese vehicle. This is inspiration for peace. And to give you a very concrete example, I phoned the French ambassador to the UN two weeks ago saying, hey, his name is Nicola, Nicola. We need to organize an event at the UN about space as an inspiration for peace. Because it's only about domination, colonization, occupy Mars, wars. We can do better. And everybody is at all in front of space. It speaks to our mind about scientific mind, spiritual mind, artistic mind, enduring mind. It speaks about who we are as humans and we are people who can love and who can share. And I think this is also what space has to bring to us. So and doing things together doesn't mean we share technology. So there is a difference between developing very critical and defense-related technology, and let's say bringing that somehow together so that we can still, everybody can be recalled that Peace is a possibility and a hope and, a, and you know, a, a path, even where there is wars here on the Earth. Thank you very much. Another question? Here, in the first row. Firstly, thank you very much for the inspiration talk about uh, the mission of space, uh, it says tonight, that's why I'm... <laughs> and uh, I have a question, but 
It's mainly about how can we make the space much more affordable to be understood by everyone in the world. Uh, we talk about that. I, I organize events about space, and everyone is space is equal to NASA, right? But a lot of people don't know much more than that. And that's why we organize this event in order to democratize the knowledge about space and so on, and much more perspective about it. Now, the question we talked about this few, way, few days uh, before with Anushe Ansari, who is, I think, you, you, everyone knows it very well. She's an astronaut, the CEO at X Prize. And the point is, how can we democratize much more this space for the children, the young generation, inspire them? And you think you, you talk about the candidates, 25,000 candidates uh, and so on, but how can we break down much more that for the young generation to inspire them? Samantha? Oh, it would actually be another question for Elaine, because that's the mission of the exploration company, right? <laughs> but okay, she's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a break. Um, I mean, uh, I think that there's, there's a lot being done about that and, uh, you know, that there's initiatives like yours, uh, there's uh, movies, there's uh, astronauts reaching out on, on social media. Um, yeah, it, it breaks my heart, of course, when you say that people still just associate uh, space flight with, uh, with NASA. We, we certainly um, have that problem, that Apollo program, and that was, uh, that was the biggest PR <laughs> thing ever. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's been just so groundbreaking historically, and it's become so part of the imagination of, of the world that it's hard to dissociate you know, space flight and, and NASA in, uh, in popular culture, uh, which is a pity, because actually at, at, you know, in, in Europe, we've, uh, we've done over the decades, we've, we've grown. Um, you know, I, I, I talked earlier about the fact that we, we have to grow further, we have to um, expand our capabilities, but one also has to say that we have come a long way, right? I mean, in the 60s and 70s, where those amazing things were going on with the Apollo programs in Europe, we would just watch on TV, literally. I mean, there was no participation at all in Europe in space flight. And then, you know, we, we've started to um, fly single astronauts on, you know, back then either Soviet assets or, or, or American vehicles. And then we've taken the next step, you know, from, from the baby step to the teenager step, and we've become part of the International Space Station. And now we're at the point where hopefully we'll make that next step and become grown-ups and, and have our own program. So I think that that is going to be a game changer. Uh, it's a little bit what I say when I when I when I try to convey that message that investing in space exploration is going to really change also the self-perception in Europe because all of a sudden we are going to be there in the grown-ups league doing space flight. And so when we have our own European vehicles that fly, it's going to be, I think, very hard even for the uninterested public not to notice not to understand that it's not anymore something that the Americans and the Russians and maybe the Chinese do, but it's something that we do as well. I mean, we, we already do in a lot of aspects, right? You know, we are certainly first league in uh, Earth observation and navigation and satellite communications, but that is not necessarily the stuff that really sparks the imagination of the general public. And so I think once we're gonna have that vehicle, their own European space flight capability, that's gonna be the game changer. Yeah, let's just allow me to add on that. And human spaceflight will always at the forefront, of course. But I do think there is so many great missions, and all the missions we do of observation of the Earth, learning about the Earth, about the climate change as well, of course. These are, coming back to your question, they are usually worldwide common missions. Not even only ESA missions, but we need the Japanese, the, I mean, whoever. And, and this is so much unknown, and we just need to pull it out and make it visible. That's as well about inspiration of space, and it's so much in the common interest of all of us. Thank you. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Samantha. <clears throat> thank you, Hélène. Thank you, Sabine. Thank you very much for being here today. Yeah.